Welcome to Building Community. The U.S. Census estimates that there are approximately 380,000 veterans living in Massachusetts and 22 million across the United States. These are men and women who have served and sacrificed for our country and our citizens. I'm your host, Donna Rodriguez. I'm also the proud daughter of a Vietnam veteran and retired U.S. Army serviceman. Today, we're going to explore the changing needs of our veterans and their families, and we're also going to touch on services and supports available to them in our communities. For our conversation, I'm joined by Roxanne Whitbeck, the Veteran Service Officer for the Town of Plymouth and 13-year Navy veteran, and Phil Ryan, Marine Corps veteran from the Vietnam era and past commander of American Legion Post 40 in Plymouth. Thank you both so much for coming in today. I appreciate it. Thank Good you. afternoon. Would you like to start off perhaps by telling us a little bit about your service? Sure. Um, I was 13 years in the U.S. Navy. Um, I got out at the rank of E7 and um, settled in Plymouth with my husband. And uh, we have a son that's currently serving at Walter Reed in um, Maryland, serving the wounded warriors. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And you are the veteran service officer for the town of Plymouth. Yes, yeah, yes, I am. And Phil, would you like to tell us a little bit about your I background? I, I joined the uh, United States Marine Corps right out of high school in 1961. I uh, did a little over four years uh, in there. Uh, I spent 14, 15 months in Okinawa, the late 63 to mid-65. Uh, this was just prior to Vietnam uh, busting out. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we were coming home on the troop ship, uh, they turned the ship around three times to head wow. back to Okinawa because they didn't know what they wanted to do with us. But finally, they let us go home. And then uh, just prior to, I was supposed to get out in August of 65, and I had 10 days left. And then all of a sudden, uh, great president said, why don't you guys stick around for another four months? <laughs> so I did four years, three months, and 17 days Wow, a proud and service. And you've been in service, both of you have been in service to our veterans ever since in the community, so thank you so much for that. Thank you. What I'd like to talk a little bit about today, maybe start off with, is what are some of the needs that are unique to service people, particularly who have served during wartime? Um, I think the most important thing is um, if they're not coming to you for services, just trying to recognize people in the community, veterans that may need services, because they're not always willing to come to the door to, to get services, but um, just trying to interact with them and get them involved and keep them engaged in the community. Now, did you have a comment as well, Phil? Well, there's a misconception about the American Legion, actually all American Legions. Uh, People just think it's a, a bar room, but it really isn't. You come into our building, which is a brand new building, but it's, it's a family affair in there. Everyone looks out for each other. Uh, veterans came, come in there to talk to veterans about veterans. And the mission of the Legion is truly, is truly that, for veterans to support one another well, as the, through their readjustment and throughout their lives. We're right. there for the vet, veteran, their, his family, his children. Now, the American Psychological Association is, says now that they believe that veterans, it can take up to three and more decades for them to start to realize some of their needs or the impact of their service, particularly during wartime. Are you finding that veterans, as they, as they age, we're talking now, it's the 50th anniversary of Vietnam. Right. Um, you said it was really starting in 1965. Um, are you finding that, that, that our Vietnam veterans are starting to discover new needs? Um, well, there there are the triggers, the uh, age, um, age in orange, the veterans that have been exposed to that, and I don't think there's a time frame on when those develop. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still taking claims for veterans that are were exposed to age in orange all those years ago, so um, I don't think it's a time frame. It's not something, you know, it's something that could go on for years now still to come. We can still be taking claims. What about emotional and psychiatric needs? We have um, counselors that come to our office. Um, Two times a week, on Monday and Friday, we have, uh, excuse me, Tuesday and Friday, we have Andrea who comes, and then we have David Stone who comes on Wednesday. So we do have counseling available three days a week right here in Plymouth, which is great. Now, from uh, some of the reading I've done and some research, uh, I've, I've been seeing that some of our Vietnam veterans, you know, particularly folks who came home and got straight to work, that so many were young and had young families that they were growing and, and working a full career, that as they're getting to the age that they're retiring, now we're starting to see, as they have more free time, thinking about that themselves. they're starting to develop PTSD and mm -hmm. other psychiatric needs. 
Is that mm. something that's fairly common, do you find, in your work? I, I agree with everything you just said. That's, that's what we're seeing, too, the people that are coming in that now have time to focus on themselves. Absolutely. And with the younger kids, um, you know, the current conflict, we're not seeing a lot of those guys yet. So I think that you're right. They are going to have time to concentrate on themselves now and more time. Also, with the American Legion, I know here in Plymouth, we had a very hard time recruiting Vietnam veterans into our organization. They want nothing to do with it. They were afraid, I think, of how they're going to react. They, they weren't welcomed home very nicely no. when they came back and they just took it out on everyone. We are now, I would say the last 10, 15 years, now we start to see Vietnam veterans, Vietnam era veterans also, coming in, joining the American Legion. And is it true also that, that unfortunately, that, that was the, that particular war, people were not welcomed home? That's no. Many service people wouldn't talk about their service. Right. And I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for people returning and having to push everything that they dealt with inside. And they didn't come home to open arms. They came home to a country that was angry at them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't their fault. They just did what they were trained to do, sent off to do, you know. Now we've thankfully have learned from that and I think our, our veterans have helped to teach us as well that with the current conflicts with Afghanistan and Iraq, we've seen a distinctly different experience for service people coming home. Right, definitely. I agree. And no, we don't have the draft, uh, we don't have the draft like it was in Vietnam. A lot of those kids didn't have a choice. They had to go. Mm -hmm. A lot of the kids now that are serving are stepping up you know, they're stepping up to the plate. They're serving two and three, you know, four times deployments. deployments. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, it's a whole different ball game. So, for somebody who is not a veteran or does not have a veteran in their family, can you describe what um, what needs people would have for readjustment when coming back home from a deployment? Things that a regular citizen might not even think of. Um, I think it's important for them to number one touch base with their veteran service officer, because we have a um, just an unending amount of resources that we can help them with education, filing a compensation, um, just help them with whatever they might need. But I think um, organizations like the American Legion, where they can form peer-to-peer -peer friendships, they can go to a place and be welcome and, and feel at ease, I think that's a very important part of our community also. To have a social network of Absolutely. people who understand your experiences. Well I agree with Roxanne 100%. They have the same problem with the veterans of foreign war posts here in mm -hmm. town. Uh, throughout the whole state, the same thing. It's, it's not just American Legion. But what we try to do at our post is welcome them in. You want to talk? Fine. If you don't want to talk, fine. When you let them bring up the subjects, they have a tendency to talk a little bit more. Right. Then they get relaxed and they trust you. Now, we... we the Vietnam era people, it was, it was really bad. They did, my brother's a Vietnam veteran. He still won't talk. And he's been out of the service 40 years. He just won't talk about it. And that's not uncommon from that's what I understand. That's not uncommon whatsoever. No, it whatsoever. So not just about their feelings, but about their experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, you were saying that there are a lot of, in addition to having a uh, social and peer support, whether or not people are comfortable disclosing their experiences, there's also a lot of support through the Veterans Office and through the VA. Right. So there, we're really learning a lot about the, the emotional and psychiatric needs of our veterans. Right. And I think in, in Massachusetts, we're so lucky because we have levels, um, we have support on the state level, and then we also have the VA on the federal level. So um, veterans are getting help on both levels if they need it, which is great. And Massachusetts is fairly unusual in our country in that they do have, a, there's a state law that mandates that there are veterans service officers or agents right. for every community. That's and correct. For smaller towns, it might be two or three together. They'd be like a, uh, yeah, they have, um, you know, it could be like a cluster of towns have a, a district, so to speak. Or like Plymouth, um, I also am the agent for Plimpton, and I'm a part-time agent there because it's such a small community. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's the great thing about Massachusetts is that is um, the Mass General Law Chapter 115 that you were speaking of is uh, it mandates that a veteran in his family or her family that's 200% below the poverty level will have resources to bring up their standard of living to where they can make 
ends meet. And it also works for our elderly veterans who are on a fixed income and don't have another resource to bring more income in. So it's a really, really very good program. Now tell me a little bit about um, how many of your counterparts are there across the state? Approximately 350. That's amazing. And what are the types of things that as a veterans agent or service officer you would be responsible for? Um, well, we, you know, we bring the person in and we do an assessment as to what, they, what their immediate needs are, make sure they have a home, make sure they have, if they're elderly, they have food, they have warmth, they have um, their medicines. All those things are critical. Excellent. And it really is. It, do you find that there are some barriers to people coming in and, and accessing your services? I think so, because people, we don't look at it like a hand out. We look at a hand up to help them whether it's a temporary helping or if it's going to be helping them for the rest of their days. It's just something that the, the veteran has earned for him and his family or her right. and their family, and it's an, it should be passed on and taken full advantage of. Absolutely, and in, in, in thanks for all the work that they have done for all of us. Absolutely. Now, I didn't realize that the services are also available to family members. Can you? Is it for just children? Is it for spouses? It is for the veteran, the spouse, and if it becomes a surviving spouse, it would be, you know, the surviving spouse and children um, up to, I believe, 26 years of age if they're still in school, you Wonderful. know, if they're still in college. All right, well, thank you both so much for, for helping us kick off this conversation. We're going to take a brief break and come back, talk a little bit more about some of the services that are available to our veterans, as well as some of the amazing services we have available in our communities. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be right back after this brief break. Hydrea for Heroes strives each day to give back to our deserving military veterans by assisting them through challenges and transitions in civilian life. We provide support services throughout southeastern Massachusetts. Our range of services includes adaptive home renovations, vehicle modifications, specialized mobility equipment, and custom veteran and family support. We also offer local workforce training seminars for veterans. If you or someone you know is a veteran in need of assistance, please contact us directly. To learn more about Hydrea for Heroes or our seminars, please visit our website. Our veterans sacrificed a great deal to serve our country. It is our honor to give back. Welcome back. In this episode of Building Community, we're talking about veterans' needs and the services available in our communities. I'm joined for today's conversation by Roxanne Wickbeck and Phil Ryan. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Really appreciate your time and being able to talk about some of these issues. When we went to break, we were starting to talk about some of the services and supports you were able to uh, connect local veterans to in your work as a veteran service or officer for the town of Plymouth. Could you tell me a little bit about the variety of services and supports you can help them access? Sure. Um, pretty much if it has the word veteran in it, we address it in our office, whether it's housing, um, if they need financial assistance, if they need help with education, um, applying for benefits on the federal level, anything like that. It really is a fantastic resource because even if you're not directly offering those supports and services, you're able them. to connect. Yeah. You're kind of the clearinghouse, aren't you? Exactly. Now, you also do a lot of work with our community service organizations that yes. provide supports to veterans. Um, tell me a little bit about the Southeastern Mass and, and what is available down here. Um, I think there's great resources here. Um, we have um, the clinic here in Plymouth, mm -hmm. so if veterans want to access um, you know, needs that can be serviced by a clinic, uh, and prescriptions. That's, that's a VA clinic, correct? Yes, the VA clinic, correct. Um, they could go apply for VA health care services um, and not have to go to Brockton or Jamaica Plains. So it's something that's local to us, which is great. And that's something that's new, too, isn't it? It's something yes. that's been wanted, people have wanted in this area many, for a long many time. Years, right. How long has it been open? Oh, gosh, what do you think? Three well, or four years? Three, four years. Okay. And so they're able to offer day-to-day -day services there? Yes. 
Wonderful. Can they apply for services when they go there? Or do they have to go up to Boston or Brockton? Nope. They can apply here in Plymouth. And um, there, there's a couple of doctors here, and they can be seen here. And obviously, if they have you know bigger healthcare needs, they would go to Jamaica Plain or Brockton. Now, uh, we were when we were talking before off air, we were saying mm -hmm. that there's just so much available, particularly with healthcare um, for our veterans, that sometimes people aren't aware of. Everything from hearing aids to vision testing and really more advanced work as well. Is that right, correct? Right. And uh, depending on the level of disability, if a veteran service connected 10% for hearing, they can get hearing aids. Um, if a veteran's 100% service connected for more severe um, issues, they can get dental. And they, there's a whole bunch of benefits that open up at that point. So could you talk about that a little bit more? Because I don't know that people understand um, what, what you were just saying. So if a veteran who mm -hmm. has served um, has any health issues that are related, related to, to their service, mm -hmm. they could then get additional support. Right. How would they go about having that evaluated or even finding out if they were eligible? The first way would be to come to see a veteran service officer, and we would take a claim. The claim would go to Boston. Then they would be called in for comp. Um, compensation medical appointment and then the VA would determine at that point if it was service connected or not. Um, once a veteran becomes service connected there's a lot of resources as far as like they would get property tax abatement, um, they get a monthly stipend from the VA, they would be eligible for VA health care at a high priority group level um, and the more severe the disability the more benefits that come along with it like a 10 percenter compared to a hundred percenter the benefits are way different you do know, you, way more involved. Do you think people uh, are always aware of the benefits that are available no, to them? No, I don't. And I wish that we had a better way to get our the word out there. But the only thing I could say to veterans, new, um, older veterans, any veteran, is just stop by your veteran service officer office and just check and see what you might be eligible for. And let it's them get it. to know you as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Would you like to share the story you were telling me earlier of a, a gentleman who didn't realize that he had service-related right, disability? Right, right. He was a Vietnam veteran, and he came in because he was looking for help with hearing aids. And I, he mentioned he was in Vietnam, and I asked him about some of the triggers that are tied to, Viet, uh, to Agent Orange exposure, and he had one of them. So he's going to come back and see me, and we're going to file a claim for him. But he didn't know. He was looking for something totally different. Now, if I may... I was talking to Roxanne one time, about four, four or five years ago, at the Legion, and I was telling her how I'm having a problem hearing. And she said, well, let's, let's look into it. She helped me file a claim with the VA. I had no idea. Went to the VA, had my consultation with them. They said, yes, you have definitely service-connected hearing loss. Now I am a 20% disabled veteran because of just talk with her. And you're able to get help and medical support and for your hearing loss. Every year, I, I get my I get updates on my hearing aids. That's amazing. And it hasn't cost me anything. Now, I think um, particularly is it, and it may be very different for um, different types of service. But I, with Agent Orange in particular, mm -hmm. um, for our Vietnam vets, so many of the symptoms that can be tied back to the exposure right. are things that people might mistakenly think is age or general health issues. Exactly, exactly, and that's why if it's anything that even remotely could be tied into it, I file the claim. I don't feel like I, I would never say to somebody, no, I'm not going to file your claim because it's not relevant. Let the VA make that decision, you know, because on the off chance it is relevant or it leads to something else. You, you just never know. So that's, it's always worth the visit and maybe going for that claim. And what are some of the, the typical health issues that you would see that would be service-related for, for Agent Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, The Agent Orange would be um, heart issues, um, diabetes, um, prostate cancer, things like that. Um, for the newer veterans, the current conflict, um, the burn pits, um, they, uh, they have like environmental exposures to not so much as chemical exposure, but burn pits and things like that that lead to respiratory issues and chronic fatigue. So... That's, that's kind of like a work in progress like it was with Vietnam. It might be years before the, all the health issues come out we for, this current, understand. Right, for this current conflict. Now, what about um, post-traumatic stress disorder? Mm, that's the hidden, that's the hidden um, 
It, it, you, you don't know. You don't know what a person is, is feeling, what they're suffering, what they saw, how they processed it, how it affects their life to this day. Um, unfortunately, our, our veterans of this current conflict, we have a very high suicide rate. So that tells me that, the, unfortunately, the PTSD issues are not being addressed. You know, they're not coming for help. And, and that's a sad, sad, sad statement to is, me. Do you know if there's work being done to, as outreach for our younger <clears throat> veterans who are returning to help to connect them to emotional psychiatric support? I think, I think that there are when they go to a stand down and, and, you know, when they're getting out of the military. I think there are, but I don't know how, I don't know how well it's working. Okay. Now, um, in addition to local officers, where are other places people can go to get support? Would you like to talk a little bit more about some of the more community-based supports? Describe a little bit about uh, your particular legion. We've, we've referred to it before, but talk a little bit about Post 40 and the work you do and the different groups of people that you impact. We're, we're, we're very family oriented. Uh, anytime a veteran, a veteran, no matter a member or not, anytime comes in for our front door, we need help. Can you help us? We always try our best to help. And then when we can't, we refer them over to Roxanne. Typical, a World War II veteran about four months ago came, came to us. He wasn't disabled, he didn't have much money, but he needed some help in uh, redoing his home. He needed a new bathroom. Well, we talked to a contractor and $5,000 later, he got his new bathroom in. That's fantastic. You know, that's what we do. Uh, I would say that all veterans post do the same thing. I mean, we're always helping the children of veterans. Actually, we, we help the children uh, of non-veterans, mm -hmm. no matter what. It, we we want to help anyone and everyone that needs it. The best thing that we do is when we walk march in a parade, we see that sign, thank you. That's or fantastic. You go, up, you go in the airport or the bus station, you always see people going up and say, thank you for your service. That's what pays us. And all, I think all of, um, all of you who are in the, the service organizations, you're constantly giving service not just to the veterans, but to the entire community. Oh, yes. Because everything you do impacts the entire community. And it really helps to make all of our towns a better place to live and everybody supporting each other and being aware of things that are important beyond your front door. Now, you work as well. Um, the Legion works with some of the other veterans organizations also. Yes, we're very active with the VFW here in town. Uh, all the other uh, American Legions mm -hmm. here in the state. Uh, wherever, wherever we can, we work with. We never work against anybody or any organization. We're very active with uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity. We're very active with uh, Hadrea for Heroes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in the process of working with Habitat to get a house built for a homeless veteran down, or a disabled veteran down in the uh, Manomets area. That's fantastic. Yeah. They're That's just wonderful. going through the, uh, the permit permits. process. Mm -hmm. So it really is, it, it was one of the reasons I really enjoy doing this show as well is because we're able to talk about how everybody does work together and support one another and really helps to build the health and wellness of our entire community um, for all of our members. You have a, a particularly interesting story. We only have a couple of minutes left, but I remember several years ago, you were responsible for helping to bring uh, a replica of the Vietnam mm -hmm. Wall here. Would you like to talk a little bit sure. about that? Uh, the, uh, as an active member of the, uh, the Post Color Guard, we were invited up to Middleborough about six, seven years ago to participate in the opening ceremony of the moving wall, the Vietnam moving wall. And we did, and we, we were very impressed. I'd seen it down in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. a couple of times. The first time, I mean, there was relatives on that wall that I hadn't seen in a long time. So I was talking with this, uh, the gentleman who ran it up there, and he says, all you do is just make a phone call. So we talked, and about two weeks later, it was decided we are going to do it in Plymouth. And I started making phone calls here in Plymouth, and nothing but support. It took us, uh, we raised the money to do it. They we come, they come down, spent a week down here, and they said this is the best place they've ever been to, in Plymouth. We had uh, <clears throat> over, over 200,000 people come by. 
It was very moving. It was yes. an incredible. It was an incredible sight all across the waterfront, mm -hmm. and there were people there 24 hours a day reading the names of everybody on the wall. Yep. Standing guard of the wall. Mm -hmm. Now we only have again just a couple of minutes left. Um, tell me, for each of you, um, with the work that you've done over the years, you know, supporting each other and and other veterans, what have you taken away? What has it given back to you? I think the most moving part of the job that I've had is dealing with our Gold Star families because they're the families who have made their made the ultimate sacrifice. They've lost a family member. And we have um, several Gold Star families here in Plymouth and they are just, you know, they're, they're the best and they're just humble and they're always giving. Um, at Christmas time, they want to make somebody else's Christmas better. And it's, it's just, it's heartwarming. And I think that's probably um, the thing that I think that's touched my heart the most is the Gold Star families. The strength even with the their loss to support each their, other. Exactly, exactly. Phil, what about you? The, the, the nicest thing about being a veteran, being a member of the American Legion and all the work I do and we do is marching in a parade or just go walking down the street and they see my pin and they say, thank you for your service. That that's, makes me a millionaire. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and everything that you've had to offer. We're also going to be listing a lot of resources on the Building Community page on our website. So for all of our towns, there'll be a number of resources for anybody who does need support or services. So thank you again for joining us for this episode of Building Community. For replay times and more information, visit pactv.org. If you have show ideas, comments, or questions, email buildingcommunity at pactv.org. Thank you.